What up, what up, what up? Welcome back to Sam Dunks, the weekly NBA show over at Slab Stocks. I'm your host, Sam. Today, we are looking at the 2020 NBA draft class according to their Prism Silver rookie card prices. We're looking at the top 10 players, certainly some high prices that we've seen so far since Prism did just release. Uh, but where can we find some value? Who's the best buy currently? That's what we're going to be getting into. First, we're going to be bringing on Slab Stocks Aaron so that he can lend us some of his expertise. And then we'll jump in looking at the rookie list. So uh, let's get going. We're starting off the episode being joined in by Slab Stocks. Aaron, Aaron, it's an honor for you to be on my show today. Yeah. Hey, it's been since uh, the bubble, I think. We were talking about Donovan Mitchell and his price is going down as he's getting eliminated. And we're talking about, I think, if he should be a buy back in August. So it's been quite some time. It has been. It's uh, good to have you here today. Uh, we're going over Prism Silver, well, Prism Rookies and you know how to buy, when to buy, who they should be targeting. Um, you know, good buys right now, bad buys right now. So we'll be covering all of that afterwards. But to to get into that episode, I wanted to just you know talk with you and lay out some of the groundwork of of you know the differences in the, in the market right now due to the PSA price increases and shutdowns and everything else that's going on. Um, we did just see the very first Prism base PSA ten Lamelo Ball sell sell the other day. I think it was like eighteen hundred dollars. Uh, I saw Heroes for Sale posted. That was the first I saw it. Um, but, uh, so a lot of people obviously reacting to that but right now, since the great, you know, tremendous price increases, probably not going to be seeing a whole ton of competition for these rookies, you know, as far as like, there's just not going to be flooded with PSA tens anytime soon. So, you know, considering all these different changing dynamics, you know, where do you see this prism rookie market going, especially compared to last uh, previous years? All right, so if you all remember back to last year when 2019 Prism released, I guess that was almost two years ago now, Zion and Ja, Prism-based rookies were getting bought up like crazy. People were buying them, grading them via value submissions, grading them via economy submissions, even possibly express. Uh, they were just getting bought up and graded in bunches, and that's how we get those super high pop reports like we have now. This year is going to be completely different. Uh, Sam brought up about the whole grading thing going on with PSA not grading anything for under $300 right now. And that definitely affects the market. So there are other outlets to go to. You know, SGC, HGA, CSG, BGS are four of the biggest others than PSA. Um, there are other outlets. Given the current prices of those places, the current prices of the cards, and then the future value on these things... I don't really know if it's worth it for you all to be grading your prism base and your prism silvers through these other companies right now, unless you're like really just trying to nickel and dime your way up. Um, and then on the flip side too, if you get a nine from any of those places, you're definitely going to be losing money on your grade. So keep in mind a 10 is not guaranteed anywhere. If you get a PSA nine, you're definitely making back the most you can on a single nine grade. So it really hedges your bet if you know you have a good condition card. If you think you can get a 10, it might be worth it to send it into somewhere like BGS. Obviously, if you can get a 10 there, there are 10s out sell even PSA 10s, uh, even though that gap has closed a lot. Um, but sending them elsewhere really doesn't make sense because if you do get a 9.5 from SGC, definitely gonna lose money. Uh, I guess it depends on the card I'm talking about too. Like if I'm talking about LaBella Ball Silver Rookie, like you're gonna make money on an SGC 9.5 sending it there potentially. I'd say we don't really know at this moment, but I would still wait. I might either pay up and get it graded by, by uh, PSA for $300, or I'd wait until PSA reopens. It might not be July 1st. I know what they said that, uh, but it might be a little bit longer. But I'd say just wait it out. Send a PSA when they reopen. Um, if you can and if you're willing to hold for that long, that's great. Uh, if not, sell raw possibly right now because once the off season comes, Potentially, they're, you know the market might drop a little bit. And then another thing is with the grading being so expensive, there's going to be potentially better cards on the market right now to buy. That's another opportunity, potentially, if you're willing to wait. 
because people don't want to wait. They want to sell them non graded. And if you can hold on to them, it might be a good time to buy and get some clean copies. I know a prison was kind of tough this year on centering as well as football. And then I would also say Sam was curious about if people should maybe, you know, subside from buying and be more selective when it comes to these prison based rookies. Like in the past, is like no brainer. You buy it, you grade it for eight to ten dollars, bingo, bango. You know, you're you're getting a PSA nine or ten and you're making money. Um, I would say yes, I wouldn't like load up right now because you are going to be having to wait for a while. Um, but at the same time, could potentially be worth it. And I would say only buy players if you're planning and grading by PSA that you believe is going to actually be effective over the next year and a half because you never know how long these submissions might take. So you really got to you know, have your thinking cap on when it comes to prospecting on these players and then grading them for the future value of them. It can definitely still work out. It's much harder. It's much more competitive now. Uh, if you want, you can take a shot on these other grading companies personally. I'm not going to be doing that at all, but if you want to, you can go for it. That's all I got for the little grading talk here. I hope you enjoy the rest of Sam's episode. So uh, I had some technical difficulties with Aaron, but thank you, Aaron, for recording your answer for us and lending us your insight. Keeping all of that in mind, we're going to be looking at the top 10 rookies based on their current Prism Silver auction prices. And I'm getting these by averaging their auctions from the past weekend. That is April 10th and April 11th. Quite a few auctions that we could average out for most of these players. Now, obviously, historically, a lot of these are pretty high prices. So it's important to keep for us to keep in mind all of the different factors that Aaron mentioned. Uh, really understand who we're buying so we can figure out where we can find our best values so starting off, we have Lamella Ball coming in at an average auction price of seven hundred thirty-five dollars and twenty-five cents. Uh, again, this are these are his Prism Silver rookie cards, and they're all raw since we don't have uh, any graded yet. Lamella Ball, of course, injured for the rest of the season, but he's averaged fifteen point nine points, five point nine rebounds, six point one assists, and one point six steals. That's all while shooting a pretty effective. Uh, effective field goal percentage of 528 just a hair under league average on 5.3 three-point attempts per game he's hitting at 37.5 percent really good and then he has a value over replacement player of 1.4 again really good so the mellow ball much deserved rank at the top of the list uh, his strengths coming into the draft have proven to be maybe even better than expected and his weaknesses coming into the draft haven't been nearly as detrimental as many had been concerned you know, of course, his passing ability is is the thing which which most people consider to be really a generational level talent coming from Lamelo Ball, and it really just does transform the offense. You know, think about guys like Steph Curry, Damian Lillard. They have the ability to stretch the floor out beyond thirty feet, which really just transforms the way the offense works. Or you can think about how Giannis can pretty much just get to the hoop and in any gap, which really transforms the defense around him. And Lamelo Ball has that same sort of quality with his passing ability. He really shortens the court with the ability ability of to, to see passing lanes and access passing lanes that normally just aren't there. Uh, really remarkable stuff from him that we saw during his, his rookie year. And if he continues on his current trajectory, he's going to be a very, very, very good player for many years. You know, obviously, $735 does make you wince quite a bit, but he certainly earned his spot at the top of this list. Next up, the first overall pick, that's Anthony Edwards, $614.63 on average over the weekend. He's been averaging 17.9 points, 4.4 rebounds, 2.6 assists, and 1.1 steals on the year. Uh, he's doing so on a less effective shooting, but 46.4% effective field goal percentage. He's chucking a ton of threes, 6.7 three-point attempts per game, not hitting very much, 31 and a half percent from downtown and in general he's been a net negative a negative 0.9 value over replacement player uh, he has been on a meteoric rise of late in part due to Lamelo's absence and you know we need someone to take you know the top billing of the rookie class uh, but also he's been you know, showing some excellent play of late so he's really been rising up this chart uh, in his value on the card market. You know, to start the year, we saw the flashes of athleticism, but we never really saw that much of an overall package put together. But things have gotten better as the year have gone, which, gone on, which is exactly what we want to see from a rookie. You know, in fact, since Ryan Saunders was fired on February 21st, Anthony Edwards has been much better, nearly 23 points per game in that stretch. And the effective field goal percentage has you know, risen up quite a few notches during that time too, which is showing us just, just enough as the fourth youngest player in the league that we can expect some pretty good things for him to come. 
Next up, third on the list is Tyrese Halliburton at $200.50 on average over the weekend. He's averaged 13 points, 3.2 rebounds, 5.1 assists, and 1.2 steals per game. A very effective shooter at 57.8 effective field goal percentage, 5.1 three-point attempts per game, hitting really good. Again, 41% of his threes. Um, and also very valuable player, 1.1 value over replacement player. A really, really good stuff for the rookie. And I love Ty Tyrese Halliburton. And he's long been, you know, kind of a basketball nerd darling, which is originally why I loved him. Uh, but he's also just been everything that we expected and more in the NBA so far. He's the type of player that doesn't make many mistakes and he just loves to make his teammates better. But he's also confident enough to go out and just get buckets for himself if he knows that's what the team needs. And he's simply the type of player that every single team in the league would be happy to have. And he'd make every single team better in one way or another. He'd find a way. He has a usage rate under 20%, so less than a fifth of possessions end with him taking a shot or turning the ball over. But while his usage rate is so low, only 17.6%, his assist percentage is 23%, meaning that while he's on the court, he's assisting almost a quarter, quarter of every teammate's baskets. He's doing all that while boasting an effective field goal percentage of 57.8, which is four percentage points higher than the league average. And it just doesn't hurt you, and he helps you in so many different ways. Now, Certainly, he's not the flashiest player ever, and you can see that in the price discrepancy between him and the players above him, so that might limit his upside on the card market. You know, But don't be surprised if you have people banging the drum for him in future years as an underrated player, which often leads to players being properly rated or maybe even overrated, and that certainly helps their card market prices too. Uh, next up, Alexei Pokashevsky from the Oklahoma City Thunder. He is sitting at $190.47 on average. Probably a bit of a shock for most of us. Uh, he's averaging 7.6 points, 4.8 rebounds, 1.9 assists in one block per game, uh, shooting a 410 effective field goal percentage. Not very effective overall. Uh, 3.9 three-point attempts per game. And also, again, only 29% of his threes is what he's hitting, a negative 0.7 value over replacement player. So, again, a bit of a surprise for Poku to be sitting here fourth on the list. Now, he's definitely this high, probably due to his meme ability. Uh, you know, I, or I don't know if meme ability is the right word, but, you know, basically, people see a seven-foot-tall toothpick shooting threes and, and just throw in some of the wildest circus passes that you've ever seen. There's just this immediately strong likability factor and, and a strong desire for his success. And I think a lot of that is what's driving his card market prices. So obviously the numbers aren't much, but since he's become a starter, he's scored over 20 points four different times and he's scored in double digits nine out of his 15 starts. So there's been some added fuel to his card market fire of late. Now, he would not be starting or even necessarily playing on pretty much any other team, but he's on the Thunder and they've embraced the tank. So he's going to be getting all the minutes that he can handle. Should his cards be this hot? Probably not, I guess. But, you know, he's an extremely likable player and he has all the makings of a fan favorite. And that's a lot to do with that's what we have a lot to do with all of this. So if you're spending one hundred ninety dollars, you're certainly hoping that he can continue to improve. Uh, but there are some some things that we can like there in that package. Next up, fifth on the list, James Wiseman coming in at $179.10. His season just ended too. He's at 11 and a half points per game, 5.8 rebounds, uh, just under an assist, just under a block, shooting 55 0.2% true shooting percentage. I changed it to true shooting percentage because that includes uh, free throw shooting from a big man. That's important to consider. 2.2 free throw attempts per game, hitting 63% of those. Not super great. Uh, and he's at a negative 0.7 value over replacement player. A really up and down year for James Wiseman. You know, he started out super hot at the beginning of the season, but the inexperience showed. You know, there are a lot of mental errors on defense, and eventually he was removed as a starter at the end of January. The starting lineup was 17 points worse with him on the court than when he was on the bench. Then he got hurt for most of February, and he recently was moved back into the starting lineup. Kerr has started drawing some, you know, some actual offensive sets specifically for him. So that's been a good development. And then now he's obviously torn his meniscus out for the rest of the season. So somewhat disappointing overall. He's certainly just loaded up with talent. And, and we'll just have to hope that he gets better in time for the offseason workouts. And you remember, 
barely played at all in college at Memphis. He missed the regular the regular offseason due to the, the whole COVID pandemic. And then when he showed up in the Bay Area after being drafted, he tested positive for COVID. He missed training camp. He missed all the preseason games. So him getting some actual offseason work this offseason will be absolutely pivotal for his development. So we just have to cross our fingers and hope for that. Next up, sixth on the list is Patrick Williams of the Chicago Bulls, $151.13 on average over the weekend. He's averaging 9.5 points, 4.7 rebounds, just under a steal, just under a block per game. He's hitting about 53% from effective field goal percentage, 2.1 three-point attempts per game, hitting 38% of those. And overall, he's been a little bit of a net negative, negative 0.4 value over replacement player. Uh, for a guy that came into the league as a high upside athlete, he's shown a remarkable amount of polish on defense, especially, but you also see some polished flashes of it in his passing ability on offense and just in offense, you know, on the offensive side in general. Uh, you know, if you look at his shot chart, there's really no selectivity going on. You know, he's just going to shoot the ball from anywhere. And the trouble with his offensive game at the moment is that he often passes up open threes in order to dribble into contested mid-rangers. Probably has to stop if he's going to continue to grow as an offensive player, but he's a rookie. And these are the types of things that we expect from rookies. He has quite a bit of ways to go to tighten up his offensive game, but he has the body, he has the physicality, he has the defensive ability, and some of the natural shooting ability that if you squint, you might almost see a Kawhi Leonard-like player there. Obviously, that is a best-case scenario and not really fair to compare him to Kawhi Leonard, but a lot of the tools that he needs, he already has. He has to work on his ball handling. He has to tighten that up. He has to work on his shooting. He has to work on his selection from shooting, specifically his pull-up three-point shooting. But if he can work on those things and polish up around the corners, he has the makings of a really special player. Pretty decent risk to take at $150 in my opinion. Next up, Emmanuel quickly coming in at just under 120 bucks, 119.25 or 25 cents, I guess we normally say that. He's averaging 12 points, 2.4 rebounds, 2.2 assists per game, and a half a steal. 48% uh, from effective field goal percentage, shooting five three-point attempts per game, hitting 37% of those, and he's been a net positive, 0.8 value over replacement player. Now, I've been really high on Emmanuel quickly. He's sitting here so high up the rookie list in part because he's impressed so much relative to his draft position. 12 points, two assists. Doesn't exactly scream off the page, but you know he's been just an exciting scorer at different times in the year. He's shown enough to really just get you dreaming. He has gone through a bit of a slump in recent weeks, which you know has left people talking about a rookie wall, but really... If you look at all the rookies and how they progress through the season, you know, historically, there is no evidence of a rookie wall. It's just a talking point what people like to bring up. Most rookies do get better as time goes on. He's just going through a bit of a slump at the moment. I believe in his three-point shooting ability. I believe in his you know, the ability of his floaters. He's just a dynamic uh, shooter as he's driving into the lane and he throws up a floater over the defense. He should be an exciting score-first guard for many years to come. And, and being in a huge market in New York, it can only help his card market standing. If he keeps slumping, he'll probably drop in price. But there's enough to like there that he should be a good buy, especially if his card market starts to cool or continues to cool. Next up is Denny Avdia coming in at $118.20. He's averaging 6.6 .6 points, 5 rebounds, 1.2 assists, and 0.6 steals per game. A 505 effective field goal percentage, 3.3 three-point attempts per game, hitting just under 33% of those. And he's a net negative, according to VORP, negative 0.6. So clearly on-court performance is not what's driving Avdia's market at the moment. And he came into the league with this huge groundswell of support, and that support still exists for him in spite of a disappointing first season. Now, Jonathan Sharks, I had him on for an interview a couple weeks ago, perhaps you saw it. Uh, he mentioned in that interview that his role is so different now from what he had in Tel Aviv. You know, there he had almost a Luka Doncic type of role. And in Washington, he's really, you know, just kind of parked out on the perimeter, which is not his game. And that's why he's struggled. And we should have been able to predict that, really. You know, the Wizards have Russell Westbrook on the books for two more years. And unless there is some drastic changes, the ball is going to continue to be in Russell Westbrook's hands. So 
you know, as and also in addition to that, as long as Bradley Beal is there, we can expect Denny to just not have the opportunities to dictate the offense, you know, which is the style of play that got him drafted so high in the first place. Long term, I'm a believer in Denny, but he's just not so, shown so much steady improvement as the season has gone on, which is a bit worrisome. But again, the situation that he was thrust into was going to be a tough transition for him. Certainly much too early to write him off. Uh, really hoping that maybe things open up for him in Washington and he can get an opportunity to showcase some of his playmaking ability, which he has in spades. Next up is Theo Maladon of the Oklahoma City Thunder coming in. It's quite a bit of a drop off between Denny Avdia and the ninth place in this list. Theo is coming in at $75.36 on average. He is averaging 9.8 points, 3.4 rebounds, 3.4 assists, 0.9 steals, uh, shooting an effective field goal percentage of 471. He's attempting just under five three-point attempts per game, hitting 36% of those. He has been a net negative at negative 1.1 value over replacement player. Uh, this was one of my personal big surprises on the list. I didn't think there would be enough attention focusing in on OKC for Maladin to be sitting this high in the top 10, but here he is ranking at number nine, and he deserves it. You know, With OKC embracing the tank, he's been getting a ton of minutes, especially with Shea sidelined over the past couple of weeks. Maladin's been starting, he's been taking the opportunity in stride. He's shooting it a ton, he's shooting it confidently, and over his last 10 games, coinciding with SGA's absence, he's averaging 16 points, five rebounds, and three assists per game. Pretty good for the 19-year-old second round pick. Now, like a lot of players that come over from Europe, he's just very crafty, both as a shooter and as a passer. He creates looks in a lot of ways that people just aren't looking for. So it's been fun to watch. And with OKC having a ton of high upside picks coming down the pipe, it seems like they may have already hit a gem in last year's second round. So a lot to like from Theo Maladin. And then rounding out our top 10 is Sadiq Bey. Uh, he is averaging, well, he's going at an average price of $65.33, and he is averaging 11.2 points, four rebounds, 1.3 assists, 0.7 blocks per game, hitting about league average effective field goal percentage of 541, six three-point attempts per game, hitting a dynamic 38% of those six three-point attempts, and 0.4 value over replacement player all around. Really good stuff from Sadiq Bey. Now, he was drafted to be a 3 and D player, and he's been all of that in this regular season. He's attempting six threes per game again in only 25 minutes per contest, and he's hitting 38% of them. That's just an extreme level of three-point shooting that we don't often see from rookies. You know, Per 36 minutes, he's averaging just under nine threes a game, and that's exactly what the Pistons want from him. He's been less effective inside the arc so far, but over the past few weeks, as teams try to run him off the three-point line, he's shown a large improvement inside the arc. You know, over the last 15 games, he's shooting 57% in the paint, which is what he needs to do to keep defenses honest. He's a bit older, having just turned 22 years old, which theoretically limits his upside. But the things that he's good at, he's already doing at such an elite level. He's a really, really, really good building block to have for a rebuilding Pistons team. So there's your top 10. Uh, certainly some high prices and, and maybe some, you know, some of them or most of them probably out of our comfort level, especially since we are dealing with rookies here and, and there's so much uncertainty going forward as you're trying to project rookies. Um, I think there's some value on this list. I also think there's some value in the players that are just after these 10. The next 10 players on this or the next five players on this list are Jaden McDaniels. He's at $63.57 on average from over the weekend. Now, he's really been flying under the radar for the Minnesota Timberwolves. He's actually having a sneaky good rookie season. And the counting numbers aren't eye-popping. He's on a terrible Wolves team, too, which probably plays into his him being overlooked. But he's an excellent shot blocking and three-point shooting big. Uh, since becoming a starter, he's averaged 11.4 points in 1.4 blocks per 36 minutes, all while he's hitting 36% of his threes. So, you know, for an athletic 20-year-old big man, there's just a lot to like from his game and certainly a lot of opportunity for him moving forward in Minnesota. RJ Hampton is the 12th player on this list. He's at $62.60. He didn't get a whole ton of opportunity on a stacked Denver Nuggets team, but since moving to Orlando, per 36 minutes, he's averaging 16 points, seven rebounds, two assists, and a steal and a half. One of the most naturally gifted athletes coming out of this year's draft. Getting him the opportunity to play and hone his game, that's really huge, and he's, and he's getting it right now. 
Uh, you got to like that pickup for Orlando and also kind of like some of the sneaky upside is that in that card as an investment. Next up is his teammate Cole Anthony at $61. Uh, he missed 25 straight games due to injury. He just returned recently. He's been pretty inefficient overall, but in the 17 games as a starter after Markel Fultz went down and before Cole Anthony went down with the, the fractured rib as he did, he did improve. He even shot 37% from downtown during those games. Still a ways to go shooting the rock, but an interesting prospect. Next is Killian Hayes at $63.57. Uh, that price has much more to do with the expectations and his potential than his actual on-court performance. And he still only played in 11 games so far this year. He looks pretty overmatched in just about all of them, I'd say. But he's extremely young, and making the jump from the French League to the NBA, especially as a point guard, that was always going to be extremely tough. So you cannot write him off at all. I think $64, yeah, it's Pretty expensive based on what we've seen from him. But based on everything that we saw from him before he was drafted, there's plenty left to dream on. Uh, might be a bit of an expensive bet for most of us, but uh, certainly someone to keep in mind as we move forward. And then the 15th and final rookie to look at today is Alabama native playing in New Orleans, Kyra Lewis Jr. He's at $54.33. Uh, really just has not gotten much opportunity for minutes as he is behind Lonzo Ball and Eric Bledsoe on the depth chart. But in games when he plays over 20 minutes, of which there have been 10 of those, he's averaging just about 11 points and four assists per game, not per 36. That's just per game. So again, we're still not talking about a whole ton of, min ton of minutes here. Now, sporadic as his playing time is, he's fairly effective when he does play. Now, who knows what's going to happen to Lonzo Ball this offseason? Certainly, people in New Orleans want him to stay. No idea what Lonzo wants. Kind of hard to tell. Uh, Eric Bledsoe is on contract for two more years, but he should not be a roadblock to getting more minutes for Kira since, hey, I love Bledsoe, but yeah, he's pretty terrible in general. Uh, so you would hope a regular role is coming next season for Kyra Lewis. Uh, understandably, $54. Again, generally a pretty expensive roll of the dice, but he's got an exciting team around him, and he certainly has a lot of talent, uh, which got him drafted fairly high. Uh, I would expect good things to be coming for him. So I guess, in summary, if we're just to look at these top 15 overall and, and just go with my gut, I'd say... You kind of wince at some of the prices, but I also still feel like there's just some good value here. Now, certainly, Lamella Ball, he's on a great trajectory, $735. That's a lot of money, and it takes him out of the running for most of us. But he still is a player that I think has kind of all-time potential. Not all-time great potential, but he has the potential to be you know, a really, 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 really good point guard and one of the top in the league for quite some time. Anthony Edwards, again, he's shown some flashes of brilliance, and I really like what we've seen for him. But then going down the list from there, I think Tyrese Halliburton, I think he's a good value at $200. He's going to be a really good player for quite some time. Pretty much every single team on the league, on the entire league would love to have him, and that should tell us a lot about where his card market value should lie. Uh, Patrick Williams, he's another one that pops out, 150 bucks. Uh, you maybe again a little expensive for our taste, but he has a pretty clear path forward to exceed his current prices. And then some of these guys for under $100, uh, just a lot to like. Maladin, Bay, McDaniel's, Hampton in general. You know, just thinking in terms of if I could get 10 RJ Hamptons for the price of one Anthony Edwards. There's a lot of upside to RJ Hampton, and it might just be good to look at all this in those terms. There probably won't be a ton of graded rookies out by the end of the season, and assuming there's an end of the season sell-off, you might be able to snag some of these guys on better prices heading into the offseason. You know, it's not the draft of the last few years, but there's going to be some really good players out of this draft too, and perhaps you'll be able to capitalize on some of these guys and take in some profits. That's all we can hope for. All right, so it's been fun looking at the top 15 players. It turned out to be top 15 players in this year's uh, Prism Silver release. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. I hope you uh, gained something from this. And as always, we'll see you next week. Again, thanks again.